السلام 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 بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وخاتم النبيين محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وسلم تسليما respected ulama, guests, and students. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I've been requested to complete the reading of Sahih Muslim and also share a few thoughts with you. So let me just quickly read the final two hadith and then I'll say a few words. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa bi-sanad al-muttasil minni ila al-imam al-Muslim ar-Rahimahullah qal Haddathana Amr ibn Zurara qal Haddathana Hushayn an Abi Hashim an Abi Mijlis an Qais ibn Ubad qal Sami'tu Aba Dhar radiyallahu anhu yuqsimu qasama inna hadhan khasman ikhtasamu fi rabbihim inna ha nazalat fi al-lazeen barazu yawm badr حمزة وعلي وعبيدة بن الحارث رضي الله عنهم وعتبة وشيبة بن ربيعة والوليد بن عتبة وبه قال حدثنا أبو بكر بن أبي شيبة قال حدثنا وكيع حا وحدثنا محمد بن مثنى قال حدثنا عبد الرحمن جميعا عن سفيان عن أبي هاشم عن أبي مجلس عن قيس بن عباد قال سمعت أبا ذر رضي الله عنه يقسم لنزلت هذان خصمان بمثل حديث حسين. These are the final two hadith of Sahih Muslim. In fact, it's one hadith for the students of ilm and the ulama. The second hadith is actually just a mutaba of the first one. The final book of Sahih Muslim is Kitab al-Tafsir, in which Imam Muslim, rahimahullah, narrates a number of ahadith in which we find a commentary of the verses of the Holy Qur'an. And this is the final hadith about one of the verses of Surah Al-Hajj. Simple translation is that Abu Dhar radiallahu an, he swore in the name of Allah that the verse of Surah Al Hajj, Hadani Khasmani Khtasamu li Rabbihim, which means these are two adversaries who have disputed in relation to their Lord, that this verse. Abu Dhar radiallahu an used to swear in the name of Allah that this verse was revealed about six particular people, two groups of three people. Hamza. Hamza, Ali, and Ubaidah ibn al-Harith radiallahu anhum. And the other party was, or consisted of, Utba, Shaiba, and Walid ibn Utba. So this is the actual hadith. Now what does this all refer to? In the Holy Quran, in Surah Al-Hajj, we have a number of verses which compare two groups of people. So on the one hand are those, the one party, 
That one party, the first, is one that will suffer torment in the afterlife. Allah will be displeased with them, nay, angry with them. And they will suffer adab. And it's actually described in some detail, which I won't go into. So this is the first party. The second party is one which, in contrast to the first party, will receive the pleasure of Allah. Allah will honor them. Allah will love them. Allah will elevate their ranks. And they will enjoy the bliss and the rewards of Jannah. So there are a series of verses which speak about these two groups. Very simple, two contrasting groups. One, Allah will be displeased with them. And the displeasure of Allah is not a small thing. On the other hand, the other group in the Akhirah, Allah will be immensely pleased with them. Allah will honor them, reward them. And again, some of the rewards and bliss of Jannah are described in some detail. Now, the, there's always been a question as to which two groups is Allah referring to? And the beginning of that section begins with the words, These are two adversaries who have differed and fallen into disputes about their Lord. So who are these two groups? Now ultimately the ulama say that the two groups are those who believe in Allah and those who don't. Imam Mujahid, Imam Ata, Mujahid ibn Jabr, Ata ibn Abi Rabah, both of them students of Abdullah ibn Abbas and Abdullah ibn Umar radiyallahu anhuma, and both of them authorities of tafsir, they both actually said that the, the verse, these verses are general. And the two groups being referred to are also general, rather than referring to specific individuals. And obviously they took this understanding from the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum themselves, like Abdullah ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhum, he says the same. So the question is that, the two, well, who are the two groups? The first group is the believers. The second group consists of those who don't believe in Allah. So these are the two groups being referred to with the words, هَذَانِ خَسْمَانِ اخْتَصَمُوا فِي رَبِّهِمْ these are the two adversaries who have disputed or who have fallen into dispute regarding their Lord. Now, regarding this particular verse, Abu Dharr radiallahu anhu, one of the most famous companions, he never used to interpret this in general terms. Rather, he would apply this verse and the following verses he would apply them to specific individuals. And he would say categorically that this verse, in fact, he was so emphatic about this that he would swear in the name of Allah. And that's what this hadith speaks of. Qais ibn Ubad says that Abu Dharr radiallahu an yuqsimu qasaman. He would swear an oath in the name of Allah that wallahi, by Allah, this verse, هَذَانِ خَسْمَانِ اخْتَصَمُوا فِي رَبِّهِمْ was revealed, or it descended, about two groups of people. And who are the two groups? He says, not general, but rather it refers to, on the one hand, Hamza, Ali, and Ubaidat ibn al-Harith. And on the other hand, the, the other group is Utba ibn Rabi'ah, Shayba ibn Rabi'ah, and Al Walid ibn Utba. And in fact, Ali radiallahu anhu 
one of these three, Ali radiallahu an, he himself says that Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi relates this, that I will be the first person to sit and kneel before Allah in his court on Yawm al as a khasm, and that's what this verse refers to. So what's a khasm? The verse is, هَذَانِ خَصْمَانِ خَصْم Khasm means adversary. Words are very important. Language is important. And it's, it's strange. Much of Urdu is taken from Arabic anyway. And this is a word which has been imported into Urdu as well. And Hindi, khasm. There's another word which is imported into Urdu and Hindi in the Asian languages, which is sunan. But see how we've distorted the pure language and how this has an effect. So, sunan, an Arabic word, means an idol, a deity that's worshipped, and not just any deity. A deity which can't be seen or touched or observed is still regarded as a deity. Being Arabic, you wouldn't call that a sunam. A sunam is a proper carved, engraved idol that a person worships. Now, in Asian languages, in Urdu, Hindi, do you know what a sunam is? Surely you know. What? A sanam in Asian languages is the mahboob, the beloved, the lover. So in Bollywood songs, which I'm sure you know nothing about, and Bollywood films, which again I'm sure you know absolutely nothing about, sanam refers to a ma'ashuq, a mahboob, a lover, a beloved. But in Asian languages, in Urdu, even in the Muslim community, a sanam is a lover, true, but you'd never call the husband a sanam. A sanam is an illicit lover, an illicit ma'ashuq and mahboob. Someone with whom relations are haram. So even in Urdu, that's what you call a sanam. Now see what we've done with the purity of the Arabic language. What do we call an illicit lover and beloved? Sanam, idol. To be adored, to be worshipped. And in Urdu as well, and in Asian languages, do you know what you call a husband? Anyone know? Khasan. So you call the, an illicit lover sanam and you call the rightful husband to whom you are betrothed in holy matrimony. You call him what? Khasm. And what does khasm mean? An adversary. Someone that you are in conflict with, you in dispute with. Someone that you are litigating against. Someone that you are facing off in a court. That's what you call an adversary. So the petitioner and the defendant, the accuser and the defendant, these are the two khasm. So in Urdu, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, we've ended up calling the husband the khasm and the, the illicit ma'ashuq and mahboob and lover the sana, the one worth, worthy of being worshipped. And can you imagine, we import this language and this is what shapes our thinking, our culture, our understanding of life. The husband is a khasm and the illicit lover and ma'ashuq and mahboob is a son. But anyway, Ali radiallahu an says, I will be the first khasm. The first adversary, to, or the first person to face off an adversary in the court of Allah on the day of reckoning. 
And he was also referring to this. Abu Dharr radiallahu an was very close to the Ahlul Bayt. And he was someone who held the Ahlul Bayt and the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in great esteem. And he revered Ali radiallahu an. Of course, all the Sahaba radiallahu anhum loved the Ahlul Bayt. But Abu Dharr radiallahu an was renowned for this. In fact, he was very, very close to Ali radiallahu an. This is why even those who normally accuse and abuse the other Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they have a lofty opinion of Abu Dharr al-Ghifari radiallahu an. So this is the context of the hadith. Abu Dharr radiallahu an, referring to Ali radiallahu an, and Hamza ibn Abd al-Muttalib, and Ubaidat ibn al-Harith, he says that th- this verse of the Qur'an, هَذَانِ خَسْمَانِ اِخْتَصْمُوا فِي رَبِّهِمْ These are two groups, two adversaries, who have faced off against each other, and who have fallen into conflict against, with each other about their Lord, that this verse is not general, referring to believers and unbelievers in, generally. Rather, he said, وَاللَّهِ يُقْسِمُ قَسَمًا كَانَ يُقْسِمُ قَسَمًا he would swear an oath in the name of Allah that by Allah, this verse reveals, re- refers to, and this verse was revealed and it descended regarding these two groups. So why did it descend regarding these two groups? And it says in the hadith that barazu yawm badr. They appeared on the day of Badr. Now, if we can go back to what actually happened. In Badr, in the second year of Hijrah. This was the first major battle that took place between the Quraysh of Mecca and the Muslims of Medina. And it happened at the wells of Badr. Now, traditionally the Arabs, when they would face off against each other, they would have armies albeit small, and before the actual battle, they would have duels. And in fact, this was customary even in other parts of the world, where before the battle, two individuals or two very small groups would face off against each other and engage in a duel. And then the main battle would take place. So on Badr as well, on the day of Badr, three of the Quraysh leaders came forth. And they were the three mentioned in the hadith of Abu Dhar radiallahu an. Utbat ibn Rabi'ah, Shaybat ibn Rabi'ah, and, and Al-Walid ibn Utbah. So Utbah, his brother, Shayba, they were both sons of Rabi'ah, two brothers. And the third person was a son of Utbah. His name was Al-Walid. He was actually the brother of Hind, Bint Utbah. Hind, the wife of Abu Sufyan, she was the daughter of Utbah. And this is why she was incensed, because she, in the Battle of Badr, her father was killed, her uncle was killed, and her brother, Al Walid, was killed. So these three came forth Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, Shaybat ibn Rabi'ah, and Al Walid ibn Utbah. And they announced that, is there anyone from the Muslim camp who will come out and challenge us in a duel? This was known as Mubaraza. So some of the Ansar Sahaba radiallahu anhum came forward three. Now, these were Ansari companions from al Madinah al-Munawwara. So they came forth. So Utbat ibn Rabi'ah, and Shaybat ibn Rabi'ah and Al-Walid ibn Utbah, they shouted that, who are you? And so they mentioned their names. They said, go away. We won't face you. They were a very proud people. So they said, we will only do Mubarazah, we will only face off with, and we will only engage in a deal with our equals. And you are not our equals. So the Quraysh of Mecca, 
always regarded the indigenous population of Yathrib as inferior. So the main tribe of Makkah al-Mukarramah was Quraysh. And the main tribe of al Madinah al-Munawwara, which until the Prophet wasallam did hijrah, was known as Yathrib. So the main tribe of Yathrib, as it was known at the time, was the Banu Qayla. Was Banu Qayla. Who was Banu Qayla? Banu Qayla consisted mainly of Aus and Khazraj. So Aus and Khazraj were actually cousins. These were the two main tribes of Madin to Munawwara because they descended from one ancestral grandmother known as Qayla. So Aus and Khazraj were collectively known as Banu Qayla. So the main tribe of Makkah was Quraysh and the main tribe of Yathrib as it was known at the time was Banu Qayla. So the Quraysh always looked down upon the Banu Qayla, upon the Aus and Khazraj. They regarded themselves as being superior. So when the Ansari Sahaba radiallahu anhum came out and they said, who are you? And they said, we are, they identified themselves. They said, go away, we won't face you. We won't, we won't accept your challenge in a duel. You are not our equals. So they held them to be inferior. And then they shouted to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that, oh Muhammad, bring out our equals to face us in this duel. So the Prophet ﷺ announced, O Ubaidah, go forth. O Hamza, go forth. O Ali, go forth. So these three Sahaba anhum came forth. And the initial duel took place. Now, why were these three Sahaba anhum sent forth? One, they were from the Quraysh, just like Utbah, Shayba, and Al Walid ibn Utbah were from the Quraysh. But not only that, they were from the same family. So, Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, Utbah, his father was Rabi'ah. Shayba, his father was Rabi'ah, they were brothers. Walid was the son of Utbah, so his grandfather was Shayba. Uh, sorry, Rabi'ah. Who was Rabi'ah? Rabi'ah was the son of Abd Shams. And Abd Shams was the son of Abd Manaf. This is important, actually. Hamza radiallahu an was the son of Abd Muttalib. Ali radiallahu an was the son of Abu Talib, the son of Abdul Muttalib. And who was Abdul Muttalib? The son of Hashim. Hashim was the brother of Abd Shams. And the third person, Ubaidah. Ubaidah was the son of Al Harith. Al Harith was the son of Al Muttalib, not Abdul Muttalib, Al Muttalib. And who was Al-Muttalib? Al-Muttalib was the brother of Hashim and Abd Shams. So there were four main well-known brothers, all sons of Abd Manaf. And those four were Abd Shams, Hashim, Al-Muttalib, and Nawfal. Why is this important? Because, subhanAllah, in order to understand the early history of Islam, you have to realize that these were all cousins of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, very close cousins. Utbah, Shaybah, Al-Walid ibn Utbah, Abu Sufyan, Hind, all of them were fa- from the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Across the generation, across certain gaps, Hind was a cousin sister of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Not the first cousin, but further further away. Abu Sufyan was a cousin brother of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is why Ismail Bukhari and others relate when Abu Sufyan traveled to Gaza in Palestine 
but he actually traveled to Sham to trade after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah in the sixth year of Hijrah. So after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, because the Muslims of Medina and the Quraysh of Mecca had agreed a truce, Quraysh could now travel to Sham because earlier on they were unable to travel because the, Meccan, uh, because the people of Medina would prevent them from traveling and attack their caravans. So because of this truce, they were able to go. So Abu Sufyan prepared a huge caravan and he traveled up north to Sham. When they traveled up north to Sham, some of the areas where they would trade, remember Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also traded in Sham. So the places where he visited were Basra, which is in, uh, in Arabic is known as Busra. It's in modern day Jordan. And he traveled to Dimashq, Damascus. And Palestine was a famous area of trade as well. In fact, Prophet Sallallahu great grandfather, Hashim, one of the four brothers, Hashim was trading in Palestine and he actually passed away in Palestine, in Gaza. So the Arabs, the Quraysh, they would refer to Gaza, modern day Gaza. They were, it's a traditional uh, ancient town, trading town. They would refer to Gaza as Gaza to Hashim. They would actually call it Gaza to Hashim. Why call it Gaza to Hashim? Because that was the place where their great grandfather, Hashim, had passed away. So they would actually refer to it as Gaza to Hashim. So when Abu Sufyan was trading, Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi, he relates from Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, who relates from Abu Sufyan, that when he traveled after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, they were stationed in, in Gaza, in Gaza. And Heraclius, the Roman emperor, who was in Jerusalem, Quds, he summoned them because he wanted to interrogate them about this new prophet that had emerged in Arabia. So Abu Sufyan and his whole caravan of Quraysh travelers and traders were all brought to Jerusalem. And there, Abu Sufyan, uh, Heraclius, he interrogated this group. And before he interrogated them, he asked them one question. He said, which of you? Ayyukum aqrabu nasaban lihada rajul? Who of you is the closest in lineage to this man, this emerging prophet, or this prophet who has emerged? So out of that whole caravan of many, many traders, all of the Quraysh, who stepped forth? Abu Sufyan. He said, I am. Because he was the closest to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And how was he the closest? Because his father was Harb, whose father was Umayyah, whose father was Abd shams So it's that same Abd shams Umayyah was the brother of Rabi'ah. So they were all very closely related. And again, in order to understand the early history of Islam, the Umayyads ruled. So you had the four Khulafa, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiyallahu anhu. He wasn't from Abd Munaf. He wasn't from Abd Munaf. You had Umar ibn Khattab radiyallahu anhu. Again, he wasn't from Banu Abdi Manaf. But then you had Uthman ibn Affan. He was from the Umayyads. He was from the Banu Umayyah. Then you had Ali ibn Abi Talib. He was from Banu Hashim. All the children of Abdu Manaf. And then you had Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. Again, from the Umayyads. And their rule lasted for approximately 100 years after the Al Khilafat al Rashida. And then after the Umayyads, the Abbasids were in power. And their rule, at least nominally, remained for approximately 500 years. So for 600 years, the Muslim empire was ruled by the descendants of Abdu Manaf, either the children of Hashim or one of the children of. Abd Shams. This is why this early history, or it's important to know this. And this is what this hadith actually refers to. So these three came forth. Utbat ibn Rabi'ah, Shaybat ibn Rabi'ah, his brother, 
and Utbah's son, Al-Walid ibn Utbah, who was the brother of Hind. And who were their equals? Hamza, the son of Abdul Muttalib, the son of Hashim, the brother of the others. So they're all cousins. That's why they were their equals. Ali radiyallahu an stepped forth. Ubaidah radiyallahu an stepped forth. Hamza radiyallahu an stepped forth. And they engaged in a duel. So Utbah was killed. Shaybah was killed. Walid ibn Utbah was killed. But Utbah, who fought against Ubaidah, the eldest one, who was Ubaidah? Ubaidah ibn al-Harith. He was the third one. We all know of Hamza. Hamza was the son of Abdul Muttalib, the son of Hashim. We know of Ali radiyallahu anhu, the son of Abu Talib, the son of Abdul Muttalib, the son of Hashim. But Ubaidah radiyallahu anhu, he was very old. He was actually 10 years older than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ubaidah, his father wasn't Abdul Muttalib. His father was Harith. And who was Harith's father? Al-Muttalib, the brother of Hashim and the brother of Abd shams And another interesting point, you've all heard of Zainab radiallahu anha, the wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So there were two Zainabs. Zainab bint Jahsh, the wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she was the first cousin, the cousin sister of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, originally married to Zayd ibn Haritha radiyallahu an. And when he divorced her, as Allah refers to in the Quran, فَلَمَّا قَضَى زَيْدٌ مِّنْهَا وَطَرًا زَوَّجْنَا كَهَا Allah refers to the marriage of Zainab bin Tujahash radiyallahu anha in the Quran. And she used to say when she would have her boasting matches with the other wives that all of you, your parents, your families gave you away in marriage and married you to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam whereas I, Allah married me from above the heavens because zawajnaakaha so that was Zainab bin Tujahash radiyallahu anha again, the first cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam but there was the other Zainab radiyallahu anha the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had another wife called Zainab she was known as Zainab bin Tujahash Umm al-Masakeen Zainab bint Khuzayma. She was married to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and didn't stay long in his marriage because uh, under a year, approximately just eight months later, she actually passed away. So who was Zainab bint Khuzayma? Zainab bint Khuzayma radiyallahu anha was the former wife of Ubaidah ibn al-Harith radiyallahu anha al-Shaheed. So Ubaidah radiyallahu anha, his wife was Zainab bint Khuzayma he was martyred on that day. So Utbah injured Ubaidah. And he was actually 10 years older than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa That's why he faced off with the eldest. Ubaidah radiyallahu anhu was the eldest. He faced off against the eldest, Utbah. Hamza was in the middle. He faced off against the middle one, Shaybah, Utbah's younger brother. And the youngest from the other side was Al-Walid, the son of Utbah, who was the youngest on this side, Ali radiyallahu anhu. He faced off against his cousin, Al-Walid ibn Utbah. So all three were killed, but Utbah managed to injure Ubaidah radiyallahu an, And sadly, he was injured mortally, and he then died shortly after Badr. So this is what happened on that day, and this is what Abu Dhar radiyallahu an refers to, that he would swear in the name of Allah, that the verse of the Holy Quran in which Allah refers to two groups of adversaries, this isn't general, referring to believers and unbelievers. Rather, this verse was quite specific, and it referred to the two parties, and the two parties were, on the one hand, Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, Shaybah ibn Rabi'ah, and Al-Walid ibn Utbah, and on the other hand, it referred to Ubaidah ibn Al-Harith, Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib and Ali ibn Abi Talib. All children of Hashim. And the others were all children of, uh, uh, of Abd Shams. And on this side, the children of Hashim and Al Muttalib. But ultimately, all of them were the sons and children of one man, Abd Manaf. Bunu Abd Manaf. So, what the Arabs would do, the Umayyads would argue with the Abbasids later. And during the time of the Prophet, وسلم, these clans argued and fought against each other. But when it came to it, they would all unite under the banner of Abdu Manaf. 
So in, in the ahadith in Islamic history, you often find the reference that you often find the reference normally people receive a notice saying quickly get off. This one says please continue until four thirty. G? So you had the children, all of them were the children of Abdul Manaf. Furthermore, the three people who were killed, Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, Shaybat ibn Rabi'ah, Walid ibn Utbah, these three, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, prayed against them. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu relates a hadith recorded by both Imam Bukhari, Muslim and others, that he was in Makkah al-Mukarramah, he came to al-Masjid al-Haram, and the Prophet in the early days of Islam, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was praying salah. The Quraysh were seated around the Kaaba. The Quraysh the leaders of the Quraysh, they used to sit in the Hatim, the broken part of the Kaaba. Not broken, but uh, the area that we see today marked off with that semicircular half wall. That is, ritually speaking, within the Kaaba, but physically it's out of the Kaaba, it's external to the Kaaba. So, that was known as a hatim. One of the meanings of hatim is a broken part. So the Quraysh would sit in the hatim. They would have cushions and divans and bedding. And they would have canopies. And they would sit in the shade, often leaning against the Kaaba. That was their seat of honor. So the Prophet ﷺ was performing salah alone in al-Masjid al-Haram. This is long before Hijrah. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an came and he saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam praying salah and he saw the leaders of the Quraysh seated in their normal spots and they were pointing mainly Abu Jahl pointing at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and then Abu Jahl said that who of you will go and fetch the salah? Yati bi salah jazuri fulanin. Who will go and fetch the salah, the amniotic sac and the afterbirth of the she camel belonging to such and such family that was slaughtered yesterday? So a certain family had slaughtered a camel. So the word had spread that this family had slaughtered the camel. So people knew that this family had slaughtered and sacrificed a camel just yesterday. So Abu Jahl said, which one of you will go and fetch the filth and the remains of this she-camel that was slaughtered yesterday? And what do we mean by filth? Salah. Salah refers to the amniotic sac. The amniotic sac is the uh, very strong membrane which encloses the fetus. So the fetus of the animal is encased and enclosed within this sac. That's known as the amniotic sac. And in Arabic, that's known as salah. So he said, which, and obviously that contains the umbil umbilical cord, <laughs> blood, the afterbirth, many other impurities. So the Arabs, if they slaughtered the camel, all of this would be cast aside and they would dispose of it later. So subhanAllah, Abu Jahl said, which one of you will go and fetch this salah, this amniotic sac, along with the other filth and bring it and dump it on the back of Muhammad? So Ashq al qawm the most wicked and the most wretched amongst those seated there, rose. 
His name was Uqbat ibn Abi Mu'ayt. So he rose and he said, I will go. And he actually went. He was one of the leaders of the Quraysh. But he stooped so low that he went and fetched this Salah Jazur, the afterbirth of the slaughtered camel. And he came. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in sujood. He was prostrating. And he came and he dumped all this filth, which was quite heavy, on the back of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whilst he was in sujood. It was so heavy. And it included blood, flesh, and the afterbirth. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu was watching. But this was in the early days of Islam. And they had very little strength or power. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu had no power. In fact, he was beaten on many occasions by the Quraysh. So he says quite regretfully that I could do nothing. If only I had some strength on that occasion or power to prevent this, but I couldn't. I had to stand there and watch whilst they did this to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And not only that, when Uqbat ibn Abi Mu'ayt dumped all of this onto the back of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Jahl and all the others, remember, they considered this to be a prank. So what do you do when someone plays a practical prank on another? You laugh. So this was to be a prank. And who was the prankster? Uqbat ibn Abi Mu'ayt. So Abu Jahl and the others, when they saw this happening, they all burst into laughter. And they were nudging each other and pointing at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and falling over themselves laughing. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu and couldn't do anything. But someone went and informed the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because this was in the early days of Islam, <laughs> Fatima radiallahu anha was still a little girl. She came running out of her house, running to Al-Masjid Al-Haram. And when she came there, she started, she was the one who actually pushed off all this filth from the back of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then she stood there abusing the leaders of the Quraysh. Fortunately, they didn't say anything to her in reply. Then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stood up. And before them, within earshot, standing before the Kaaba, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prayed against them. Saying, Allahumma alayka bi Quraysh. Allahumma alayka bi Abi Jahl in Amr ibn Hisham. Oh Allah, seize the Quraysh. Oh Allah, sees Abu Jahl. Oh Allah, sees Utbah ibn Rabi'ah. Oh Allah, sees Shaybat ibn Rabi'ah. Oh Allah, sees Al-Walid ibn Utbah. Oh Allah, sees Umayyat ibn Khalaf. Oh Allah, sees Uqbat ibn Abi Mu'ayt. Oh Allah sees Umar ibn al-Walid ibn al-Mughira. He was the brother of Khalid ibn al-Walid. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prayed against these people. And who were they? Seven. Abu Jahl. Utbat ibn, Utbat ibn Rabi'ah. Shaybat ibn Rabi'ah. Al-Walid ibn Utbah. Umayyat ibn Khalaf. Utbat ibn Abi Mu'ayd, the one who actually went and fetched the filth. And finally, the brother of Khalid ibn al-Walid, Umar ibn al-Walid. When the Quraysh seated there, heard this dua of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, their laughter quickly disappeared. And they fell silent. They became very fearful. Because even they believed, despite their shirk, that the dua of any person was accepted by Allah in the precincts of the Ka'bah. So they feared for themselves. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an relates that by Allah, at the end of this hadith, by Allah, 
I saw all of these named individuals fallen, sprawled flat on their faces in the wells of Badr. And that's exactly what happened. So right at the beginning of the battle, these three, who were named by Rasulullah in that dua, they were killed. Utba, his brother Shayba, Shayba and Utbah's son, Al-Walid. When they faced off against Ubaidut ibn al-Harith, Ali ibn Abi Talib, and Hamza ibn Abd al-Muttalib. And the others were also killed. Abu Jahl was killed in Badr. Umayyit ibn Khalaf was killed in Badr. Uqbut ibn Abi Mu'ayyit was killed. Later. And Umar ibn al-Walid, he was one person who wasn't killed in Badr. Rather, he was killed, he died in Abyssinia. Because, yeah, he died in Abyssinia. He used to visit Abyssinia a lot. In fact, when the Muslims first did Hijrah and to Abyssinia, to Habasha, and the Quraysh of Mecca sent someone to bring them back in the fifth year of Nubuwa, eight years before Hijrah, they dispatched a delegation to appeal to the king, Negus and Jershi of Habasha, that these people are troublemakers they are not refugees, do not give them political refuge. Rather, they are troublemakers, send them back. So the main person who was their ambassador to the royal court of Negus and Najashi was Amr ibn al-As, radiyallahu anhu. And along with Amr ibn al-As went who? Umar ibn al-Walid, the brother of Khalid ibn al-Walid, radiyallahu anhu. So he perished in Abyssinia. So all, all of them died on that, uh, all of them died. These were the people the Prophet wasallam <laughs> prayed against. Now, so this is what the hadith ultimately refers to. We have just a few minutes left. I, I've just commented on the final hadith itself. Uh, for those of you who found this a bit removed and technical, forgive me, I was just commenting on the hadith. But rather, what are some of the takeaway lessons? Well, one of the greatest lessons is Imam Muslim, rahmatullahi himself, relates a hadith in his sahih. It's a long hadith. The hadith ends with the words, وَمَنْ بَطَّأَ بِهِ عَمَلُهُ لَمْ يُسْرِعْ بِهِ نَسَبُهُ Whoever's deeds hold him back, his lineage, his ancestry, will not propel him forward, will not hasten him. What matters to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is amal. Not a person's name or fame or lineage, ancestry, identity, title, belonging. It doesn't matter which group you belong to, which ethnic group you belong to. Your complexion doesn't matter. Your name doesn't matter. Your titles, your prefixes, your suffixes, none of these matter at all. Inna Allah la yanzuru ila suwarikum wa amwalikum walakin yanzuru ila qulubikum wa a'malikum. Indeed, Allah will not look at your figures or your riches. Rather, he will look at your hearts and your deeds. That's what matters. Ubaid Uqba ibn Rabi'ah, Shaybat ibn Rabi'ah, Al-Walid ibn Utbah were all very rich, proud, noble dignitaries of the Quraysh. They were so proud they didn't even consider the other warriors from Al-Ansar to be their equals. They said, bring forth your, our equals. So their cousins had to come out. Ali radiyallahu an Ubaidah and Hamza radiyallahu an Majma'een they had to come out and face them. These people were proud, but they were noble and dignified in their own peoples. But none of that mattered if they did not believe in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and not just believe in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but follow him. So one of the greatest lessons for us is to today. It doesn't matter what our ethnic group, our complexion, our colour, our language, our background, our wealth, our title, our social standing and position, 
in the world. None of this matters to Allah. Wallahi, none of it matters to Allah. Once the Prophet ﷺ, what matters is amal, deeds. And so I would remind all of the graduating students, and I remind myself, and the ulama, and the talabatul ilm, that being an alim, being a shaykh, being an imam, standing on the mimbar, standing on the sajjad and the musalla, leading people in salah, giving speeches, lecturing people, sitting on stage, being admired, being hailed as a scholar, as someone intelligent and eloquent. Wallahi al-azim, it means nothing. It will all come to nothing. Nothing. These titles, these labels, none of it matters to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What matters is amal. That's what matters. So let us be sincere. Be sincere in our studies. Be sincere in our teaching. Be, sin be sincere in our pursuit of knowledge and ilm. And what really matters is amal. That's what matters. So Allah grant all of us sincerity. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those who gain the best of knowledge and act on the best of knowledge. May Allah I was, I'll end with that one hadith I was just going to mention. Once Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was seated with the Sahaba radiallahu anhum and someone walked past. He was a leader amongst his people, a nobleman. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, what do you say of this man? So they said, Ya Rasulullah, a leader of his people. When he speaks... He is heard. People listen to him. When he instructs, he is obeyed. And people do his bidding. And when he proposes for marriage, in khatab, fahariyun an yunkah, then it is only appropriate and suitable that he is married off to whomever he proposes to. It's so quite simply, this man was a leader. When he spoke, people listened. When he commanded, people followed and obeyed. And if he ever asked for someone's hand in marriage, then his marriage proposal would be accepted without hesitation. Prophet wasallam said nothing. Another man walked past. Prophet ﷺ said, what do you say of this man? And the second man was poor. He wasn't a leader. And the Sahaba, عنهم, they only told the Prophet ﷺ what they knew of him. So he said, what do you say of this person? They said, Ya Rasulullah. Someone who, if he speaks, he's not listened to. If he instructs or commands, he's not obeyed. And if he proposes for marriage and asks for someone's hand in marriage, then his marriage proposal is not accepted. So see the contrast, see the difference between the two. For the first person, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa remained silent. And you can imagine how humble this second one was. When he spoke, people didn't listen. When he instructed, people didn't obey. And if he ever asked for someone's hand in marriage, his marriage proposal would be rejected because of his lowly standing and position in the eyes of the people. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's reply was, by Allah, this one person, the second one, 
is better in the sight of Allah than the earth filled with the like of the former. This one person is better in the sight of Allah than the whole world, the whole earth filled with the likes of the former. Leadership, social standing, none of this matters. None of it. Titles don't matter. What matters to Allah is amal. May Allah grant us ikhlas and sincerity. May Allah grant us amal of what, upon what we learn. We end with this reading of Sahih Muslim. May Allah enable us to understand the hadith as we should, follow and act, follow the hadith as we should, act on the hadith as we should, and follow his noble sunnah. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala abdihi wa rasooli nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Subhanakallahum wa bihamdik. Ashadu wa la ilaha ila antastaghfiruk wa atubu ilayhi. Jazakumullah khairan for such enlightening words. Inshallah, the adhan will take place for Asr now. We will break for Asr, and inshallah, the program will continue after Asr. Jazakumullah khairan. <coughs>